appreciate uh, your gifts. We are continuing in our series on, in Ephesians this morning. So in Ephesians chapter 5, that's where we'll be reading Ephesians chapter 5, starting at verse 19. It says this, Speaking to yourselves in, hymns, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one another in the fear of the Lord. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives uh, be uh, to uh, their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he, may, uh, he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might uh, present, it, uh, present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the, the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they, uh, they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I uh, speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself and the wife, see that she reverence her husband. Chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be... A, <clears throat> that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit as I preach your word. God, may your word be as a fire shut up in my bones. In Jesus' name, amen. And so what we need to realize, last week we, we kind of hit the, you know, the first part of, of Ephesians chapter 5, and that part right there was explaining how as believers, as individuals, that we, are, that we should live, that we should walk in Christ's love as He has loved us, giving Himself uh, for us as a perfect offering and sacrifice. That is how we are to live our lives, is you know, we are to live as Christ you know, lived, that we are to, to imitate Christ as, as we are. And so what we need to do is, uh, and he said, and the way that we should do this is that we should avoid sex outside of marriage, that we uh, don't participate or be around others who would tarnish or dirty the image of Christ, that we don't covet what somebody has or, and you don't, that we, uh, that we shouldn't covet, that we shouldn't have a lust or a long, we shouldn't long for or have a strong desire for what someone has and that we don't, whatever that be, that could be someone or something. That we are not to be drunk with wine, but we are to be filled with the Spirit of God. These are things that Paul begins to, to lay out for us. He says not to have any filthy, foolish, or jesting uh, come out of our mouths. That we, uh, what comes out of our mouths should be to edify, to encourage, to teach uh, others what is suitable and convenient for those listening by giving thanks uh, to God for what He has blessed us with. Amen? And that neither, uh, neither should we be uh, deceived by others that will come up to us with vain, empty, uh, or flattering words. Because we obviously know that if a person is coming up you know, to, you know, just to kind of boost up our pride, they're, they're wanting something. They're wanting something out of you. And so that we should, we should avoid all these things that, that the Bible has just spoken about. In all these areas that we should avoid these situations, that we shouldn't even be partakers or partners with them that do these things. Ephesians 5.11 you know, uh, said this, and it says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. He's saying, if somebody is doing what I just said, you know what? You're not even you're not to, you know, to have fellowship with them because, you know, 
uh, because that way you're not even being partners with them in these unfruitful works of darkness, but you're also to reprove them. What is, what is to reprove? It's, it's to charge with a fault to the face. You see somebody doing these things. They say that they're being a believer in Jesus Christ. They're doing all these things. The Bible says that you are supposed to go to them face to face and talk it out. It says to chide, to, to reprehend, to convince of a fault or to make manifest. You are to, to bring it out. You are to bring it out and you are to, to show them where they, uh, you know, where they are coming up short in, the, uh, in their Christian walk. That we are to you know, call out, manifest, uh, you know, make manifest. That word just means to lay bare, to lay open. It, it's to have it all out on the table. And that we are to, you know, we are to go up to them, that they're speaking foolishness, that they're speaking folly, that they're doing those things. The Bible says that we are to go up to, uh, up to them and do it. Why? Because it would be a shame to not only the, the body of Christ, but to Jesus Christ. Verse 12 says, For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done in done of them in secret. And so this beginning part as we go through, he's saying this all to you know the individual believers. Um, that as we are to go, we are to not to have fellowship you know, with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. He says also, he says, when we as believers are reproving those who are backsliding or have backslidden, the Bible says in verse 14, wherefore he says, Awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Why does he say, awake thee? Because some people are so asleep to the fact of what they're doing, they don't even realize it. And if, and if something's coming up, you know, and we're in danger of, of bringing, you know a, you know, a bad image upon Christ, we're supposed to try and wake them up. We're, to, we're supposed to go to them and say, you know what, this is what the Bible says, this is what you're doing. This is what's wrong with what you're doing. And not like in a condemning spirit or an attitude, we're supposed to go to, uh, to them in love saying, you know what, what you're doing right now is goes against what the Bible says, and this is, you know, and I'll show it to you. In love. Not in a you know, cocky, arrogant attitude that says, I'm better than you, but saying, hey, you know what? You may not even realize this. And for some of us, you know, if you're like me, you know, at times, I can be a very, very sound sleeper. So sometimes you might have to, you know, be a little louder, you know. And so that's what we're supposed to do. The Bible says that we are to walk circumspectly. This is a word that we don't often use oftentimes, but it says that we are to walk circumspectly in verse 15. That word just simply means uh, you know, cautiously, with uh, watchfulness uh, every way, with attention to guard against surprise or danger. Well, think about that. Doesn't that make sense with the fact that where the Bible says that, you know, to watch out for the devil because he, he, he goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour? A lion does not get the antelope if he's going around, hey, look at me over here. He doesn't do that. What does the lion do? He's out on the prowl. He's getting ready to prowl, you know, pounce. He's, he's keeping, waiting for that opportunity. And so the Bible says, you know what? To walk circumspectly. That we are to, to look all around, making sure, you know, to see if there's any surprise or danger coming our way. And so why, you know, apart from that, why should we walk circumspectly? Verse 16 says, to redeem the time. Why? Because the days are evil. The days are evil. Ephesians 4.1 4, uh, 4, uh, talks about us, to, that we need to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. That we are to walk worthy of that calling that God has called us to. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27 says, Only let your conversation or your citizenship be as it becomes the gospel of Christ, that whether I see or I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that you walk stead, or you stand steadfast in the spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. We are together supposed to be looking out for one another and for ourselves. We are to sit there and, you know, and make sure that the body of Christ is growing. Because why? Because we're looking out for one another. Because if we're looking out for one another, what does that mean? It's less likely or it's going to be harder for the enemy to attack. Right? If we have everybody you know, uh, watching each other's back and watching our own, it's going to be very hard for that enemy to, you know, to come get us. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 14 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. That right there is a, right there is a verse for those that believe that, um, that only some people can be saved. 
and that other ones are, you know, are predestined to go to hell. Because what does it say? It says that brings salvation has appeared to who? All men. But I go on, it says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking, uh, looking for this, that blessed hope, the, appear, uh, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto us a peculiar. That word right there, peculiar, just means a special or one's own possession. Who's, who are we possessed by? Jesus Christ, right? That we are, it says we are peculiar or we are possessed by Jesus Christ. A peculiar people, zealous of good works. So that's what we need to realize is that in this entire you know, situation, this is what God has called us to do. This is how God has, you know, wants us to be, that we are denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That we are to live as Christ has called us to live. In short, basically, be purposeful in the way that you live, not flying by the seat of your pants as we wait for his return. Oftentimes, I think people wake up and they don't have a purpose. They don't know what they're doing. They just get them going, I don't know what, what's today, you know, what's on the docket for today? And they're like, I don't know, we'll see how it goes. But they have no purpose. They have no purpose. And I, I'm not saying that you plan out every single second of the day, because that's pretty hard to do, because things will happen. What I'm saying is that you're purposeful, that, you're, you know, you, you know, that you, you've planned it, that you've measured it, you've determined there are certain things in your day that you're going to do. So the thing is, is that what you should do, what you should schedule is your time with the Lord. It shouldn't be the last thing on your schedule to do. It should probably be the first thing on your schedule to do. Because if it's the last thing on your, on your, you know, on your schedule to do, it's going to be always at the end. I've, I've caught myself in this, where I've, you know, I've got up there and I said, you know what, I'm going to wait and I, you know, you know, I got all these other things to do, and then I'll get to the Word of God. And what ends up happening, my day goes horribly. I go to God's Word, and what God's Word had for me that day would have been a whole lot better because God's Word already spoke you know, you know, what I needed to know for that day. Like, I read it, and I go, if I would have read that in the morning, my day would have went a whole lot better. It's amazing how God's Word does that, doesn't it? So throughout the day, what we need to do is just... Uh, like I said, it's not going to go the way that, you know, that we want to, but if we schedule out that, starting our day off with the Lord, reading, praying, and studying God's Word, if we start off, we say, you know what, I'm going to get up, and I'm going to make sure that I go, and I know for, you know for some of us, it's hard to do because maybe you know, we're working long hours and we've got all these things going on, but if we get up in the morning and say, you know what, the first thing I'm going to do is start it off with the Lord, our day is going to go better. It's a plain, simple you know, truth that there is. But the portion of Scripture I just read you know, uh, prior to is about a Christ-centered family. Ephesians 5, the beginning part of it, talked about the individual, what I just recapped, how we're supposed to live as individuals. Now, Paul shifts his focus to a Christ-centered family and says how we can do it. So we need to get our, you know, as I just spoke, we need to get our mind right and we need to start our day off with the Lord. And this is the way that we do it. Verses 19 uh, through 21 in, in Ephesians chapter 5, speaking to yourselves in psalms and in uh, hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God, uh, unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So what do we need to you know, realize in here? I'm just going to tell you right now, um, Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3 basically say the same thing. They go on and they're, they're interchangeable. They go back and forth. But, you know, they may uh, elaborate on one point as where the other one doesn't, but they go back and forth and, and it just shows you how, and that's how I'm going to approach this uh, this morning. And so in Colossians 3.16, it uses the same wording. It tells us you know, that we should, you know, uh, that we need to speak to ourselves in, you know, in psalms and hymns. What do you say, you know, what psalms are we referring to? Well, you got 150 of them. Hymns, like the ones that we you know, sang this morning. It says in spiritual songs. We sang those this morning, right? Singing and making a melody in your heart. The people that you will find that oftentimes always have, you know, seem to have a good attitude are the ones that are doing this. The ones that you'll always see them, you know, they're always walking around. They may not be you know, singing, but their mind is constantly upon the Lord. They're always just sitting there you know, figuring out, you know, how can I you know, do this? And they always have a better perspective of those things that, that are going on in their life. 
where somebody says, oh, the, whole, you know, the house is burning you know, on fire. And then you know, the, the one person that is with the Lord says, you know what, but I got my health. You know, the house can be replaced, but my family can't. It's that what, you know, person that doesn't focus on, those, uh, on the temporal, but focuses on the eternal. And so what we need to do is memorize Psalms. You say all 150? Well, eventually. I'm not saying to do it all in one day, but eventually, you know, begin to go through Psalms and begin to read them. Because in there, you'll find out that there's good songs for Thanksgiving in there and everything else. You also find out there's Psalms where David has a hard time because, you know, he, he, it's, it's going to hit every aspect of your life. Then, you know, hy- uh, hymns and different songs. I mean, some of you already know them all. I mean, I, I was talking to a lady this week that was talking about, the, you know, the day, first thing they do, they get up in the morning, they turn on some Southern Gospel, and then they go about their day. I mean, that's a good way to start their day, isn't it? And so, in your time with the Lord, memorize Scripture as you study. As you're reading God's Word, begin to memorize it. Begin to go back, you're like, I can't do it. Yes, you can. You know how I know? Because if you're like me, in which hopefully you're not like you know, this in this respect, I can remember useless things. I am a fountain of useless knowledge. If there's some random fact you want to know, for some strange reason, I remember it. Thanks, wife. But I do. So if I can memorize that, and I can memorize different songs and everything else, and like we talked about this morning, you know, about different songs, about the fact that when we, uh, we will memorize music, we will memorize songs, and the thing is, is that if we go about, you know, songs that actually come from the Bible, then we will actually memorize the Bible. It's amazing. We had one student one time says, you know what, did you actually know that that song was written from the Bible? They just thought the person came up with it on their own. Like, they didn't actually, you know, realize that the lyrics were actually God's word. And that's how you're going to remember, you know, maybe, you know, set it to uh, music. And as you begin to memorize it, you know, re- repeat it over and over again. Repetition is a good thing. Repetition is a good thing, you know, to know. And this is going to have a domino effect on what you're going to do because you're going to, begin to, you're going to, begin to th- uh, give thanks to God without even thinking about it. All of a sudden, you're just like, thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you, Lord, that you saved me from that. Thank you. And you're going to be able to, it's going to become like a knee-jerk reaction that you're just going to go and, and something's going to happen and somebody's going to cut you off in the middle of the room and you're going to say, thank you, Lord, that, you know, that you saved me on that one. Without even thinking about it, it's just going to come because that's how your mind's going to be set. You've renewed your mind, like Romans chapter 12, verse 1 has said, and that you're going to be able to serve without having to be asked. You're, you're going to be able to serve without even being asked. You're just going to see something, and you're going, you know what, I'm going to go over there and help. And you're not, you're, you're, you may not even think about the fact of going, hey, I'm going to go serve that person right now. It's not going to be that. It's going to be the fact of, hey, I see an area of need, I'm going to go over there and do it. And you're just going to go over there, and, you're just going to, you know, and nobody's going to have to ask you, nobody's going to have to beg and plead with you. You're just going to go ahead. Why? Because you see an area of need, Right? I want you to, you know, as I get ready to go into the different areas that Paul talks about, you know, the, the wife, the uh, husband, you know, the father, you know, kids, I want you to remember this verse. Because oftentimes when it's spoken of, of the wife, for some odd reason, sometimes ladies get mad and angry and say, well, what about the husband? Verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. That is how the Christian should be anyways. And as you read this, you say, well, you know what, Pastor, I don't have a wife and kids, or I don't have, you know, a husband and kids. I don't, you know, have a a family like that. You know what, write it down so the day that when it happens, you're ready to go. And begin to prepare yourself now so that way when it does happen, you don't go, well, I better read, you know, Ephesians chapter 5 and figure this out now. You already are working on it. You already got it going, and you already are living how God wants you to live in in this way. And so when we need, uh, what we need to realize is that Paul, as he, as he, like I said, begins to shift our focus from the individual, he's now going to go to individual members of the family. Why? Because if the family is right, the church will be right. Why is it that the world, governments, all these different ones, have attacked the family, have attacked the church? Well, for one thing, you know, they're not Christian, so that's what they're going to do. And they're going to try and reset, redefine all of that. Redefine how church looks. Redefine how uh, family looks. Redefine all these things. And Paul, you know, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit says, this is how God has designed family. And if the family is right at home, 
the church will be right. Amen? Verse 22, it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. And what we need, they say, well, why do I need to submit myself to my husband? It says, as unto the Lord. Forget, don't forget that part, it says, as unto the Lord. Or as uh, Colossians 3.18 says, as is fit in the Lord. This is what we're, uh, ladies are supposed to do. This brings it all the way back to the Garden of Eden. I'm going all the way back to Genesis, all right? Genesis chapter 3 says, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow uh, thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be for thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. This is the part where ladies sometimes nowadays, especially ones that are feminists or anything else, have a problem. No man going to rule over me. Got really quiet now. Says, no man's going to rule over me. I don't care what they say. I don't care what God's word says. I don't care. No man's going to rule. That's their attitude, you know, the attitude that they have. And, and the amazing thing to me, this is amazing to, you know, thing to me, is that you'll have ladies say, I don't need a man for nothing. I heard, I, I heard ladies talk this way. That's, but they have children. My thought is, you need a man at least once. <laughs> Let me explain this. What does it say? It says in verse 23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. He's saying that, you know, ladies, you're a wife. You're, you know, he says, you are to submit to your husband. How is the woman to submit to her husband? Let's look at this. If he is saved, verse 24, therefore... As the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husband in everything. So what does that say for the husband? The husband must also submit and be subject to Christ. If he is subject to Christ and submitting to Christ, things will be a whole lot better and easier. Then it goes on to the ladies, uh, you know, the ladies, the wives, it says what? That you are to submit or be subject to your husband. If he is following Christ, because he's following Jesus, you know, he's following Christ, you, you follow him, everything is going to, you know, fall in order. But what happens if the husband is not saved? Well, amen, you're going to have problems. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 says this, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, so they're not following Jesus, they, also, uh, they, they may also, without the word, be won by the conversation or the behavior of the wives. So what is uh, Peter saying? Peter is saying, ladies, that if you will live your life according to how God would have you to live, that your behavior, the way that you live your life, will win that person to Christ. That will win maybe your husband to Christ. And you know what? It does the flip. If a husband is following Christ and the wife is not, the Bible says that you live your life the same way. You live your life, uh, you live your life, you know, the same way as being a Christian. And what will happen? That your wife will shift her focus. But here's the thing. There is a free will. That's not to say just because all of a sudden you start living your life for Christ that that person automatically is going to come and get saved. Because they'll either accept it or reject it. You know, case in point, I, you know, I know someone close to my family who started following Jesus Christ, you know, was, loved his wife, you know, more than he ever loved his wife. And they've been married for several years. And one, you know, one day she says, you know what, I want a divorce. And you say, wait, 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 Pastor, you just said that if I... No, he was living his life for... She said, came up to him and she said, it's either Jesus or me. 
And this person, you know, said, I choose Jesus, but you need to understand that I love you now more than I ever have. And I, I, I want to keep it that way. I want to keep loving you more and more each day. Sad reality was is that the spouse, his wife, had ended up saying, you know what? I'll see you later. We are not to be so quick to, to jump onto the divorce bandwagon just because one person is saved and not saved. We are to try and do everything possible to love that person like Christ loves them. And so hopefully they will begin you know, uh, to love Christ. But if they don't, then you've done everything you possibly can. And keep on trying to, to, to work that out. Keep on working uh, with them. Still go to church. Still pray. Still read the Bible. Still study. Do what God says to do. And if your husband or your wife asks you to do something that goes directly against the Word of God, then you go with what the Bible says and not your husband or your wife. Because you still need to follow what God's Word says no matter what. Because if they tell you to come out and you know, blaspheme God's name, don't go to church, don't do this. It's not an act of rebellion if you say, you know what, I'm still going to go to church. I'm still going to read the Bible. I'm still going to study because you're doing what God asks you to do. Now let's look at what God's word says about the husband, all right? Husbands, love your wives, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he, may, he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. For as, for we are members of the body, of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and the two shall become uh, shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every uh, every one of you, in particular, so love his wife as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Paul gives a greater perspective and further elaboration for husbands. Because sometimes, if you're like me, I'm I'm hard-headed. And so I need further elaboration. I need to know more uh, than what goes on, you know, in that. And so he says, husbands, we are to love her. We are to love our wives as Christ loved the church. Now we need to begin to think about that. How is that? Did Christ spare any expense? Did he hold back anything? Did he hold back, you know, how much he loved us, and, you know, how much he showed towards us, and how much he was willing to go for to purchase our salvation? He didn't hold anything back, right? He loved, he loves us with an unconditional love, and that's how we're supposed to love our wives. With all, I know this, I know, you know, gentlemen, husbands, you have the perfect wife. She is perfect. She has you know, there's no flaws, there's no faults, there's nothing else. But if by chance she does, you are to love her in spite of her faults, in spite of her flaws, in spite of those things that maybe irritate you or annoy you. You are to love her as Christ loves the church. Because Christ loves us with all of our faults and all of our flaws and all those things. that we are to, to, uh, He looks past those things and says, you know what, I love them enough that I died for them. He gave himself up, uh, up to, for us. So what happens when we do this? Husbands, when we submit to the Lord, he sanctifies us. We become further despondent or disconnected with this world and long for the day that we and our families are with him forever. We don't sit there and worry about what's going to happen in the football game or whether or not my job's going to do this or whether or not this is going to happen. This, we just say, you know what? I'm going to live, yes, my life. I, I, you know, I need to you provide for my family. I need to go out there and provide for my family. But we, beget, we, we become so uh, despondent or disconnected with this world. We're just like, you know what? I'm going to work. 
But whatever happens, happens because, you know what? I want Jesus, and I want my family to go there. That's my number one priority, is that I'm showing Christ to my wife and to my kids. Because if our first priority, you know, sorry, that should be, that's our second priority. First priority is the fact that we need to love Christ. If we love Jesus and His Word, and we're following and we're studying His Word, then we want to do everything possible to show our wife and our kids how much we love them. And if I've said this before, but I'm going to you know, bring a refresher, that men, this is how you know, things, and ladies you know, in general, this is how it should be. Christ should be number one. Our spouse is number two. Our kids are number three. Then our family, you know, then our ministry, then the church. That's how it goes. You say, well, how, that's, how is that possible? Because if you get those, uh, the first ones right, everything else will fall in line. We should not flip them. We should not become like, I am going to love my kids more than anything else and kind of forget our husbands or, you know, or our, our wives. We shouldn't. Because then, then things begin to get uh, mixed up and, you know, out of order. Our spouse comes, you know, second only to Christ. You say, well, what about my family? It's on the list. But there's a reason why it says that you shall leave your father and mother and the two shall become one. It didn't say that you bring you know, along the in-laws and everybody you know, else along and everybody else has a, uh, an opinion on everything. They're going to have an opinion no matter which way you look at it. But you, it's your family. You decide how things will look. Will uh, men, uh, husbands, will become more and more like Christ. Just like Jesus prayed in John 17, 17, it says, Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. If this is our, uh, our basis for everything that we do, the word of God, it's going to sanctify us. It's going to uh, cleanse us. It's going to, uh, it's going to do as God's word says. It's going to sanctify and cleanse us from all unrighteousness, right? If we truly long for the truth, men, then we will only find it in his word. If we want truth, it's only going to be in his word. It's not going to be on Fox News. It's not going to be in the Pemiscot Press. It's not going to be in any other media outlet. It's not going to be on Facebook or Twitter or anything. Else. Where are you going to find truth, 100% guarantee, with no political agenda, no you know, you're bent and leading left or right or whichever way you want to go, is the word of God. If you want 100% truth to tell you how it is, that's what you know, God's word does. So what happens if the wife isn't saved? Please go back to the previous point that I just talked about. What happens you know, if the husband's not saved? It, it follows the same concept. You are to live your life for Christ, praying for, that, uh, pray, praying for your wife, hopefully, that she comes to know the Lord. If she's backslidden, pray for her, that she will come back. Paul then goes on and he gives husbands a practical illustration. He begins to you know, say, this is, this is how you're supposed to, to love your wife. It says in verse 28, it says, so, men, uh, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. Verse 29, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord of the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. So as we go out and we get food, right? We're hungry, we go out and get food. We, we go out and get, you know, get what we like. We all go out. We feed or nur- we nourish our bodies. We provide for it. We take care of it. We must do the same for our wives. That's how men are supposed to be. That we are to, to nourish our bodies. We are to nourish our wives. We are to speak encouraging, edifying words to lift them up, right? To provide for them. You say, wait a minute. This is modern day. This is modern times. No, we're, men are, are still supposed to provide for their families. How archaic and barbaric are you? You're spo- men, your wife possibly may make more money than you, but you are supposed to g- still get off the couch and go work. You are to provide for your family. Stability. 
and you are to take care of your family, both, both physically and spiritually. Here's, uh, here's another point in here for men. And husbands, we are not to be mama's boys. You're like, what's a mama's boy? Think about it. It's the one that runs to mom every single time that something goes, you know, maybe your, uh, your wife did something wrong and you're like, mom, well, she did this, what should I do? Very blunt and to the point. You did not marry your mother. It just, yeah, it has to be blunt. You're not a mama's boy. You did not marry your mother. What does it say in verse 31? It says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. Who are the two? The husband and wife. You're not married you know, to, you know, to your mom. You're not married to your dad. You are starting another family. Do you like, just totally like, dust them and leave them? In the, you know, no. Obviously, they're still there. You can still go to them for advice here and there. But you don't sit there and just lay all of your junk and garbage on there and be like, well, did you know that, you know, Alicia did this? I mean, oh my goodness, what should I do, Mom? I mean, you don't sit there and air your dirty laundry on your spouse to your parents. You know what you do, uh, do, uh, you do, do with it? Is that you talk to the other person. Husbands, you talk to your wives about it. And you work it out. That's why the Bible, that's why he says earlier on in Ephesians, he says, let, don't let the sun go down on your anger. If something irritates you, talk to the person. Don't talk to everybody else about it. Facebook doesn't need any more material. When we get married, we are leaving the authority of our father and our mother and setting up a new household. We should not get our parents involved in private matters, conversations, arguments, and, and or disagreements we have with our spouse. Or, and we should not get our friends involved. It's between you and your spouse. Husbands, it's between you and your wife. We can ask advice on certain things, but when it comes to like unloading your dirty laundry, it should never be that. You, like I said, you need to, to uh, work it out and let it not fester. What's the reasoning behind the fact of not letting the sun go down in your anger? Ephesians 4.27 you know, tells us that because if we do that, we're going to give place for the enemy to stay and continue to cause division. When we allow those things, when we allow you know, the sun just to sit there and you know, when we decide, hey, I'm going to go to bed, I'm not going to reconcile this, it can wait. You're allowing it to fester and to continue, and the devil is just going, all right. I'm going to set up camp here right here, and I'm going to keep on causing division. But you remember, do you remember when she did that thing the other day? Oh, just think about what she did a week ago. You need to bring that up. You need to bring this up. Oh, do you remember how she did this? This morning? Oh, that really irritated you. You should bring that up. That's the devil. You're giving place to the enemy. You're allowing him to continue to cause division. But if you sat there that, you know, that night, as soon as it, you know, and you didn't let the sun go down on your anger, and you guys resolved it and were able to you know, reconcile, the devil has no more ammunition. He can't set up. He has, he's been kicked out. He's homeless. Colossians 3.19 says this. It says, Husbands, love your wife, your wives, and be not bitter against them. When you let things fester, bitterness happens. Verse 33, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now, I've heard sometimes, you know, I've heard this argument go back and forth. Of, you know, a wife will say, well, you know what? He doesn't love me. He doesn't do these things for me. And then the husband will come back. Well, she doesn't respect me. She doesn't do this. She doesn't do that. What's been happening? You let the sun go down your anger, it's festering, and the enemy has a foothold. We are to, husbands, let's love, honor, and cherish our wife. You remember that thing, the whole like love, honor, and obey, or the whole love, honor, and cherish in your vows? That's what God has asked us to do, and you said it in front of a whole bunch of witnesses called the wedding ceremony, right? 
And wives, you are to love, honor, cherish, and respect your husbands. As the Bible says, you know, that's what reverence means. You are to respect your husbands. Some will say he is not deserving of it. Respect him anyways. Chapter 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. It's plain and simple. Most people will say amen. I told my wife, I said, I wish this part right here, I had the kids involved. So that way they can hear this. But it says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, as we begin to look at this, it says, um, further on, it says, honor your, uh, your father and mother, which is right, uh, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with thee, that thou may uh, live long on the earth. And uh, ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And so when, we, uh, when you look at this, we go back and forth, it says, honor your father and mother. Why? So you'll live long. And it not only has, like, you know, because sometimes you hear parents say, you know, do you want to live long? And they're, you know, you're talking about giving you a whooping or a spanking. But the thing is, is that you'll notice that those people that did not honor their parents growing up end up dying earlier. Why? Because they're not, they're not going to respect that authority that's been placed over them at home. They're not, gonna, they're not going to respect the authority when they leave the house. Because it's all about them. And oftentimes what you see what happened, you'll see all this you know, violence happen where people are going around and shooting each other, and it would all be resolved if they were learned early on in the family to honor their mother and their father. All the stuff that we have, all the problems, if you want to go you know, look at different places in Carothersville in general, I can guarantee that the problems that we have in Carothersville can all be placed back to the fact that kids were not made, you know, were not told to honor their father and their mother, to honor those authorities over them. Do you know how I know this? Go to the store and see the attitude that they had towards their parents. Go to the school and see how they treat the teachers. Go to all these different places where they're supposed to respect somebody over them, and they won't. How many times have you know, I've seen a kid go up to a police officer and spit at their feet? Do you know where they learn that? From their parents. Parents need to stand up and begin to say, you know what? You need to honor your father and your mother, and you need to honor those in authority over you. I've heard stories where there's kids you know, that were in children's church that did not honor Miss Pat. She is the authority over them, and they, they'll come over there and talk right back to her, just like that. And we wonder why that we have culture like how we do now. Because they've been told, you don't need to honor your father and mother. It's all about you. Now, if you were like my dad was when I was growing up, I didn't honor him or respect him. I wasn't able to sit down for a little while. You know why? Because of the fact that the Bible says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. As parents, that's what we're supposed to do. Rebuke and chasten our kids. Discipline them. Spare the rod, spoil the child. Do I need to go on, you know, in this area? But it also, when we honor, the Lord is going to bless us. If we honor those over, you know, in authority over us, if we honor, you know, uh, how the Bible says, honor your father and mother, the Lord's going to bless us and he's going to give you a long life. If you dishonor, punishment and shame comes. If we're dishonoring, you know, to our parents, dishonoring to authority figure, uh, figures, what's going to happen? Punishment. And ultimately, shame. Where you have a lot of ki- uh, you know, kids, you know, uh, well, kids that are now adults in jail cells. And hopefully, I, I pray, honestly, that they're filled, they're filled with shame for what they did. That they actually learned in that moment. But oftentimes, that doesn't happen. They just sit there and try to figure out how to get away with it again. I have this in our kids. If there's any children, your parents are supposed to discipline you and watch over you. That's the way that God designed the family. Kids are not supposed to run the household. 
I shouldn't have to make that statement, but I have to because that's how households are being run nowadays, where the kid has full reign and, and authority, and the parents are like, you know, the, the scared people, like, I don't, I pray that they don't wake up because then they're going to take over. And I think that's the way that it is, with, you know, with some parents, that they raise their kids to have their own minds, to speak their minds, and then when the kid wakes up, they're like, they're afraid and scared, and they're like, I don't even want to, you know, deal with them anymore. And then Paul, as I've been kind of you know uh, going towards, shifts his focus to fathers, because he talks about he talks about the wife, talks about the, you know the husbands, then talks about kids, and this is one of the big reasons why I believe that most kids, oftentimes, will disrespect those in authority, disrespect their uh, mothers, is because of the fact that the, there's no father in the home. We can see a huge difference between that, and you know the you know the big thing you know, it, it, and this is something that's been you know shown in studies. Do you know where the most attack is? Which race has the most attack? It's African Americans. They, have, the government, has focused a lot of their effort in saying you know what, and they will go after you know a, a black mothers and saying you don't need them and the thing is and the guys you know the guys will go out and do whatever they want to do i'm not saying that you know that white families or hispanic or whatever don't have that problem but if you look at it the overwhelming numbers show that black families have no father or the mom you know has uh has uh, several kids with several different fathers as he shifts his focus, you know, to uh, two fathers, in verse 4 it says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, and, uh, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. He is saying, you know what, don't make, uh, you know, to make angry, to offend, to incense, to enrage, to excite, to stimulate, to increase. What ends up happening is that if we as men return what we're getting from our kids, the kids will return that. And the thing is, is that oftentimes, whatever comes in will go right back out. What's the whole saying? Garbage in, garbage out? Turn off the iPad. Turn off the TV. Because a lot of the stuff that they're learning as far as disrespect is from the television, is from YouTube, is from all those things. And you may sit there and say, you know what, I'm trying to teach my kids, but they just have this attitude, they have this problem. It's coming from other sources as well. Well, think about it in the schools. You send your kid to school, they have friends that have, a lot of times have broken homes. Those kids begin to share that. That kid, you know, they share it, your kid takes it, and your kid takes it home. And I'm not trying to dismiss everything on here and saying, well, it's all the school's fault, and it's all this fault, whatever. It's our, it's our jobs as parents. It's our jobs to stand up and say, you know what, as, as fathers... As fathers, it says, provoke not your children to wrath. You had a bad day, don't take it out on your family. And I say this, you know, to, to my own uh, detriment, because there's times where I've come home and I've been mad and angry and frustrated, and I've taken it out on my wife and my daughter. I have. I'll be the first one to admit that. To my detriment, to my shame, that I do that. I try to now, if I've had a bad day, to pray before I get you know, in the house and say, Lord, I've had a bad day. Help me to not take it out on them because they have, it, it has nothing to do with them. Do I mess up? Yes. Do I come up short? Yes. But that's not an excuse. That's not an excuse you know, uh, to do that. Dads, if, have you ever noticed that if, you, if we have, my, uh, I'm referring to myself, that if we have bad attitudes or are angry or we're happy, our kids will follow suit. If we're happy and excited, don't our kids follow your happiness? If we're mad and angry, they follow our happiness. We kind of like set the temperature, the thermostat, on how the family is going to look. So what happens when we provoke them to anger? Colossians chapter 3, verse 21 says this, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. When we are angry, when we provoke them to wrath, it's because they are discouraged. We discourage them by our behaviors. 
If we provoke them to be angry, uh, provoke them to wrath, it says they're going to get discouraged because they don't know what else to do. That's why it's so important. As Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Do we believe that? Do we? So if we believe that, if we believe that we can train them, what does training take? Years. That's why I say practice makes perfect. What do you think like football players are doing on Sunday and all throughout the week? They're training. They are practicing. Why? Because they want to get better. Then why don't we do that same thing with our family? We need to train up our, you know, a child in the way that they should go so that way later on they're not going to walk away from it, right? This is not you know, uh, to be a big rebuke to husbands and fathers. This is us you know, meaning that we need to step up. And you say, well, I am. Step up even more. I don't think there's enough steps to keep going up, you know, to be, unless you're uh, Jesus Christ and, you know, and you're, you're the perfect father. We always need to constantly be stepping up. So husbands and fathers, if you lead your wife and kids in the Lord, they will follow. I'm encouraging you to, that if you will step up, that if, if, if we will all step up and just, just each and every day, just do something a little bit, you know, different, you know, go on another step, just keep going, keep going, keep going. Your wife and your kids will follow you. They will follow you. If you ever ask that question, of why don't my kids listen to me? Lead by example. If you lead them, they will follow. Genesis chapter 18, verse 19. And I end with this. It says, For I know him. This is speaking of Abraham. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and that they should keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. If we will lead them, they will follow.